Well, deep in the timeline of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Tony Stark or Iron Man had a great dilemma on his hands. Now, some of you might be familiar with this story that comes from Avengers Endgame, uh, but if you're not familiar with this story, I need to catch you up to speed, and I might have to give a spoiler or two to do so. This movie's been sitting out on Disney Plus for a couple of years now. I just assume if you would have watched it, you would have watched it by now. But if you still would not like to have anything spoiled, use the two hands that we were given at birth and do the earmuffs just for a couple minutes so that I don't spoil what's going on. But let me catch you up to speed. By this time in the story, the saga, mega villain Thanos has just found a way to get rid of half of all of living beings. Many of these living beings uh, were family members and loved ones of some of the Avengers, and so they were wondering if there was ever a way to get their family members back, if there was a plan in order to do so. And they actually discovered a plan, but they had a couple of hiccups in this plan that they needed to try to amend. They knew two things about this plan, but there was one thing that was a bit uncertain. Number one, they knew that this plan was going to be dangerous. It was going to risk a lot. The second thing they knew is that they needed Iron Man in order to make the plan happen. But the thing that they did not know is if Iron Man would be willing to help them out in this rescue plan. Because unlike the other Avengers, Tony Stark's family stayed intact. Nobody was taken from him. They were living in seclusion. And by this time, he was the dad of a five-year-old daughter, Morgan, who he deeply loved. If you know the story of Marvel and the Avengers, uh, Tony Stark had this interesting relationship with his dad. And so he had this fear that he wasn't going to be a good dad himself. But he was loving being a dad to Morgan. One night early in the movie, there's this interesting scene of them saying goodnight to one another, and Morgan told her dad, I love you 3,000, which was her cute and five-year-old way of saying, I love you more than my words can contain. Have you ever been there before where you had this explosion of emotion, and you're trying to find a way to describe what you were feeling, and so you just thought of the biggest words, the biggest picture, or the biggest number that you can imagine? I remember when Ezra was growing up and he was learning his numbers, uh, whenever he wanted to exaggerate and make like a big number, he said 115 was like his big number. And what I loved about it is that he just sold it like we were the crazy ones that have never heard of this number before. But this presented an interesting dilemma for Tony Stark. Knowing what to do was difficult. Would he be really willing to risk everything that he had in order to help his friends and to get their family back? in this dangerous plan. It wasn't easy for him, and it wouldn't be easy for us. But we have to admit that there's a line deep within all of us, that if an occasion crossed that line, something noble, an effort to help somebody else, we too would be willing to put what we know and love aside for the sake of another person to help them. I think that John in his gospel addresses this idea at two different levels at the very end of the gospel here in a couple of the major scenes of his story, the arrest and the trial of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday. We'll cover this big passage as quickly as possible and I'll make some observations about this theme along the way as we come to it. The first thing I want to say is this, is that God, sorry, John's gospel reveals that God's love and willingness to sacrifice himself for the sake of the world is present. Perhaps more directly than any of the other gospel writers, John reveals just how rebellious God's world had become around Jesus. We read in John chapter 11 that this, this rebelliousness has come to its fever pitch. Because there's a meeting of all the religious and political elite in Israel. And they begin to wonder and worry about Jesus and his impact and influence on the world around them. They begin to even share with some exaggeration that it seems like the whole world's going to follow him and believe him. Which spelled some difficulty for them. So they decided that they would take matters into their own hands. That they would come up with an idea, find a way to get rid of Jesus. Now that plot was put on pause for several chapters. It's hanging in the background. Until chapter 18 when Jesus is handed over and he is despised and betrayed by one of his own disciples named Judas. He's quickly arrested and he's brought into custody and he's expedited through a legal process in order to be executed via crucifixion. Now Jesus being crucified is a message in and of itself. 
In Jesus' day, the punishment did not fit the crime like it does in our judicial system. But in Jesus' day, the punishment fit the person. To put it another way, if Jesus was a little bit higher in the social ladder, there might have been some other more humane way to get rid of Jesus than crucifixion. But since Jesus was disdained by the powerful structures of the day, no one thought twice about exposing him to an execution, something as ghastly as crucifixion. But this disdain for Jesus was not just at the cross on Good Friday. It was also expressed as he stood trial, and it hinted at how the corrupt the world had become around him. We take note of this in John chapter 19, verse 15. And in the fever pitch of their appeal, these Jewish leaders going to Pontius Pilate asking for license to crucify Jesus, they say something that we're not quite expecting. They say to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. Now this is an interesting sentiment. One that's in stark contrast to nearly every other expression of what it means to be a faithful Jew before this time and after this time. Take note of the heroic efforts of uh, Esther and Mordecai in the Old Testament book of Esther. How they stood in defiance against a rebellious nation, an encroaching nation. Take note of Daniel and his behavior that when he, even when he's in exile in a foreign country, he doesn't bow to another king and exalt another king, but his allegiance is to God alone. For some of those who are familiar with the period between the two testaments, the Old and the New Testament, we note the, the story of the Maccabean rebellion, that when different foreign adversaries were encroaching upon the people of Israel, some were compromising, but there's this group of people called the Maccabean dynasty that was standing against the tide of foreign countries, even risking their own life. You, you and I can fast forward 40 years after the crucifixion of Jesus as Israel is at war with Rome. They come to their last stand in a place called Masada. And if you read this, the story of Masada, you would recognize and notice there's this no compromise posture by the Jews as they face the Roman, the Roman army and the empire one last time. These stand in stark contrast to what these folks are saying to Pilate during the arrest of Jesus. But here's the bottom line. The Jews wanted to punish Jesus so badly that they're willing to say whatever it took in order to get access to crucify him. So it reveals at his trial just how corrupt the world had become around him. The other thing that the trial of Jesus shows us is how dangerous the world had become around Jesus as well. Take note of Pontius Pilate and his reluctance to punish Jesus. Historically speaking, Pontius Pilate, is, from all the material that we have, he never flinched in prosecuting and harming people like Jesus of Nazareth. According to historical sources like Josephus and Philo, Pilate was a brutal provocateur. He was violent, he was arrogant, and unmistakably cruel. So John's view of Pontius Pilate according to this gospel, is striking. Pilate tries to free Jesus from custody a couple of different times. He even tells Jesus' accusers definitively in John 19, 4, I find no reason for an accusation against him. So this begs a question. Why did someone so unbound by rule and logic and so bent on violence become so unclear of what to do with Jesus of Nazareth? Pontius Pilate is quite aware of something powerful that's working in the background in this situation, and he's not quite sure on which side this power is. And so instead of taking the time to discern where this power has come from and what side he should choose, he decides to bow out of the situation entirely as quickly as possible so he's not caught in the crossfire. But the trial of Jesus also shows just how hurtful this world can be as well. Perhaps the most heartbreaking character in the scene of the gospel is Peter. Hours beforehand, Peter vowed his devotion to Jesus. He told Jesus that he'd be with him all the way, even to his death. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter took matters into his own hands in order to defend Jesus, as we talked about last week. How surprising then, when Jesus stands trial just minutes later, that Peter doesn't rush to Jesus' defense. But instead, John tells us that he warms himself by a fire on a cold Palestinian evening. 
even more striking and even more devastating. That when Jesus is fastened to a cross the next morning on Mount Calvary, that as John is narrating the scene, Peter is not mentioned as those who are willing to be with Jesus in his last moments. A question worth asking here is why would Jesus die for a world like this? A world that is manipulative, violent, dangerous, and hurtful. What's in it for Jesus to do so? What's in it for the world? And why does it matter? What is it worth? John is clear that when Jesus is arrested and crucified, that's during the season that we call Passover in the Jewish calendar year. In fact, the day that he's arrested, John says at a couple different occasions, it's the preparation day for the Passover. I believe that John wants us to see these two things side by side, the arrest of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, and the celebration of the Passover. But in doing so, what does all this mean? What is this commitment that John is making as he tells the story? Modern Bible readers assume that all animal sacrifices in the Bible are, are the same thing. That God is angry at people, and so in order to manage sin, animals are placed on an altar and killed in the place of human beings so that God's anger is satisfied and human beings can endure. But if we get into the weeds of what happens at different times in Israel's calendar, how animals are used and which animal types are used during these different times of the year, we see that not all sacrifices are the same. The animal at Passover, which is going on at the end of John's Gospel, is different from what the animal does on, for instance, the day of Yom Kippur, what we find the description of in the book of Leviticus 16 and 17. In Yom Kippur, the sins of Israel are placed upon a goat, and that goat is taken to the edge of town to carry away, to manage the sins of Israel but what we find in the Passover is something completely different. The animal is used as a meal as people feast with God. We take note in the very first Passover as the people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt. God tells Moses ahead of time that judgment is going to sweep over the land of Egypt and take the firstborn of every household. It seems to be in response to what Pharaoh has done by killing Jewish uh, babies earlier in the Exodus story. So God tells Moses ahead of time that as they eat this this lamb, this meal at Passover, that they need to be ready to get up and move because God's going to free them from Egypt. In fact, he tells them some interesting quirky things that you need to tuck in your cloak into your belt and have your staff and sandals in your hand. Don't eat too much because you don't want to get a side stitch by how quickly you're going to move after this meal is over. But take the blood from the lamb that you prepare for your meal and put it on the doorposts. And as judgment runs speedily through the land of Egypt, it'll pass over the homes where the blood is on the doorpost. At the very first Passover, and every subsequent Passover after that, the animal is not being hurt and harmed for the sake of sin. It provides a meal, and it reminds them of the freedom and the passage that God gave for the people of Israel when they were enslaved in Egypt. Isn't this the way that we think of sacrifice? Think of an example from the game of baseball. Baseball just started again this week, and some of us are happy because of that. You know that there's many different ways to score runs in baseball, including this strategic play, a sacrifice bunt, and a sacrifice fly to the outfield. When a batter chooses to sacrifice themselves, it's not looked upon as a negative thing but as a positive thing. For they give their at-bat away for the sake of the score of the team, to move a runner to the next base or to move the runner from third base all the way home. Now, a young baseball player's parents visiting from out of town who may not be familiar with the intricacies of the game of baseball might see the sacrifice fly ball or the sacrifice bunt as something unfortunate, Because after all, my lovely grandson didn't make it to first base. What a tragedy. But in plain sight, right in front of them, a great mystery is revealed. That the batter's willingness to sacrifice their own at bat actually helps advance the success and the results of the team. 
In the same way, Jesus going to a cross and execution paves the way for God to be, for, for the people of God and for the world to be rescued. The mystery of it all has caused poets and prophets and theologians and artists and filmmakers and sometimes TV show producers to invite us into the wonder of it all, of what happened on that Good Friday. But here's the bottom line that John seems to be painting when he puts Passover and Jesus' sacrifice side by side. The sacrifice at the cross is not ultimately a display of God's anger, but of God's love for the world so that the, love, so that the world could go free and be free because of God's love for them. This is why God doesn't whisk Jesus away from earth as soon as he dies a Good Friday, but he raises him back to life, back into a body, back into the world that just crucified him because something else seems to be going on not just paying a penalty of death on a cross. Something else is going on in the outworking of salvation. But the skeptic's most honest question is important at this point. After all that Jesus has done, all the suffering, being abandoned by his disciples, being cursed by his enemies, after all of that, did anything really change? We take note that shortly after Jesus' death, we begin to see people begin to live into this newfound freedom that is handed to them because of Jesus' work on the cross, especially as they embrace the depths of the wisdom of what Jesus did on Mount Calvary. The New Testament shares an array of responses to Jesus' death on the cross, and each of these characters that the Gospels gives us, they give us a window in what it means for us what life looks like now because of what Jesus has done for us and for the rest of the world. Take, for instance, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of them are unanimous that as soon as Jesus dies, there's this centurion next to Jesus. He's a, a Roman soldier. He's overseeing the execution, making sure that everything is done properly and in order. But as soon as Jesus dies and he gives up his ghost to his heavenly father, this centurion, who's never been to a synagogue in his life, looks up at Jesus, this beaten and battered, crucified person on a cross. And he says, surely this man is a righteous man. Surely this man is the son of God. And that seems like a harmless statement by some nobody in the Gospels. But if that centurion would have reached into his coin purse and pulled out a Roman coin... On the very top of that Roman coin would have been a face of Caesar. And there would have been an inscription underneath that coin. And that inscription would have said this, Caesar, son of God. So instantly, this centurion is thrown in the midst of a dilemma. Am I going to put my trust in Caesar, whose face is upon my coins? Whose presence seems to be everywhere? Who gives me employment and safety? Or am I going to put my trust in this beaten, beaten and battered Galilean, executed on a cross. That's not just the faith dilemma of one person at one time on Mount Calvary. That's a dilemma that every single one of us are in the middle of. Are we going to put our trust in different sources offering us salvation out there, whispering to us their good news? Or are we going to choose to take a leap of faith like the centurion, as he looked upon Jesus the moment that he died on the cross. John also does this clever thing with this character in his gospel, Nicodemus. Nicodemus, we meet him early on in the story in chapter 3. He's, uh, he's an elite in a Jewish scholarship about religion, but he has a lot of questions but he's taken note of Jesus, and so John tells us that at night he comes to find Jesus and he wants to have a discussion with him. Now, going to Jesus in the middle of the night seems to have two meanings. Meaning number one, he wants to come under the cover of night so that nobody witnesses that he's talking with Jesus. Because at this point, there's a reputation that's beginning to precede Jesus as someone that you shouldn't belong to. But John also uses it as a metaphor. Because Nicodemus is in a place of darkness of soul. He's got questions. He's wondering what is up and what is down. So he has all of his questions with Jesus. And throughout that first half of that chapter, there's a spirit of conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. But Jesus does something clever. He doesn't answer any of Nicodemus' questions. Instead, 
he gives Nicodemus a quest. Gives him something to look forward to. In verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 3, he says this, Just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Roughly translated, what Jesus tells Nicodemus, follow the clues. Watch for the Son of God to be lifted up. A little bit later in the story, in John chapter 7, there's an argument among the Jewish religious leaders, and they're wondering what they should do with Jesus. They're critiquing his teaching, and Nicodemus makes the subtle break from the company line. He challenges them with a minority report. He tells his contemporaries, maybe you should allow Jesus to answer these questions himself before casting your judgment. But as the story goes on, we meet Nicodemus one more time. At the very end of John chapter 19, after Jesus has died, John tells us that two characters, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, go to the authorities with great courage and great risk and ask for the body of Jesus, this person who's just been condemned as an insurrectionist, and ask that they might give him a proper burial. But throughout John's gospel... Nicodemus goes on his own faith journey. It started with darkness and questions and fear of being noticed with Jesus. But by the end, he's willing to come out into the light and to be willing to be affi- have an affinity and association with Jesus by the end. Perhaps John seeks to present Nicodemus as a model to you and to me as well. We all sit in darkness. We're all shrouded by our questions and our fear of being noticed. But then we go on a journey just like Nicodemus. And we embrace Jesus in the bright of day, willing to be associated with Jesus as our master. Which brings us back to Tony Stark and his dilemma about helping the Avengers when they needed him the most. To not give any details, Stark decided to help them to leave his comfort behind, and it cost him deeply. But it was his own way of saying, I love you, 3,000. It was also the means by which Stark finally, after a long journey, learned the true secret of being deeply human, which is to spend your life for the sake of others. Listen, there are a lot of questions that swirl around the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And if you and I were afforded 200 more years of life, we could come to these stories year after year, this time of year around Easter, and we'll still still unearth new and different revelation about what the cross meant, why would God choose to show his love this way again and again. But the thing that matters the most, the thing that we hear the most as we come to the story again and again, is that the love of God is magnified by what Jesus did on the cross. My favorite line in all of Christian hymns and worship songs that I've ever heard so far, because I hopefully got some time to go yet, but it comes from an old English hymn called Here is Love. Here's the second verse of that song, and I think it gets to the heart of the matter. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers flow incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world with love. So we ask the question, why did Jesus die on Good Friday? It's because he loves you and he loves me and he loves the whole world. 3,000. This love sparks a response from us to give up, give our, back, our love back to God and back to the world around us. This is why Easter is so vital, even to the most seasoned Christian who celebrated Easter every Easter Sunday of all of their life. Because as we look at the cross, we're allowed to examine once more our own lives and to respond to the call to go and love all the more. Let's be reminded of what our brother, the Apostle Paul, said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. He gave the widest vision of Christianity that one has ever thought of ever since. The only thing that counts, the only thing that counts, is faith expressing itself through love. This Easter week, may this be the very rubric of our examination of our own lives. 
Anything that's not faith expressing itself through love, it doesn't count. It's like a check without a signature. It's only worth the paper that it's printed on. The things that you and I are devoting ourselves to, the energy that we leverage for the different initiatives in the, in the life around us, if it is not boldly an expression of faith expressing itself through love because of the cross, it doesn't count. So may you and I find ourselves rallying around the cross, not just because of the gift it gives us, because how it reframes all that we think and do and value from this day forward. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you for your generous love in Christ. We thank you that even though we can't get to the bottom of what this event meant, is that you ran into the midst of a world that was cruel and unfair and fearful And sometimes not very kind. And you kissed it with your love. Lord Jesus, throughout the mystery of it all, as we encounter this story once more, I pray that it would sweep us up. I pray that we might find ourselves like Nicodemus, willing to leave the darkness behind and to move towards the light and to find you there, to experience once more the depth of your great love for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said together. Amen. Let's stand and sing of this great love of our God this morning.